Uh, uh, so do we, um, all right, so I will be speaking about growth in groups. People mean different things by growth in groups, in part because they study different groups, but um, they also give slightly, though related, meanings to the word growth. So I mean really something very, very simple. I have a group G, and I have a finite subset A of G, and I'm going to consider the set A, the set A times A, which is just the set of all products of two elements of A, uh, and so on, A times A times A, A to the K would be the product of K things, right? And now I'm look, going to look at the size of these sets, by which I just mean the number of elements. So when I write this, I mean the number of elements of a set, what, they, what people call the cardinality, if they are feeling fancy. So the question is, how does a to the k, how does the number of elements of a to the k grow as k grows? Um, well, this is, this is a question that has been studied from several different perspectives. So um, there's additive combinatorics, which studies the case well, traditionally, the case of G abelian. Then there is geometric group theory, which typically works with G infinite, and it deals with really the very large scale of things. So going to K going to infinity. Of course, if we were working with, um, with G finite, it doesn't make that much sense to us what happens when K goes to infinity, because if, if A generates G, a to the k eventually becomes equal to the entire group, and then, you know, it stays constant. It's g, 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 g. That's what happens when k becomes big enough. But you can ask yourself, well, how soon does that happen? So, I can define, so let's, let's say that, assume that a generates g. By brackets here, I mean the group generated by a, and that's g. Now, um, I'm going to define the diameter of G with respect to A uh, as the least K such that A to the K is G. And for G finite, this is finite. Now, why is it called a diameter? Well, I can define what's called a Cayley graph, which is the graph that has as its set of vertices just the set G. And I'm going to join two vertices in G by an edge if their quotient lies in the set of generators. Um, very well. So this graph is connected. Why? So assuming A generates G, this graph is connected. Why? Can anybody explain me why? Yeah, exactly. So you can connect everything to the identity, for instance. Or you can connect any two things because the quotient is, in the, is, generate, is a product of elements of A. Now, you, well, for simplicity, we can assume from now on that A is its own inverse. That is, whenever you have an element, the inverse of the element is also in A. And I will also assume, unless the contrary is stated, that the identity is in A. Now, the diameter of a graph, so first of all, the distance between two vertices is the, just as in real life, it's the length of the shortest path between the two. And now I can define the diameter of a graph as the maximum as a maximal distance that you can have in a graph. The maximum of all V1, V2 of the distance from V1 to V2. And then, surprise, surprise, it's exercise one, I think, if you were looking at the notes, and it's quite easy. The diameter, what I was just calling the MGA is nothing other than the diameter of the Cayley graph. 
Very well. Um, all right, so already figuring out whether the diameter of a calligraph is large or small is very important. Um, and clearly, if you study A and it grows consistently rapidly, then you're going to hit all of G much more rapidly than if A were growing really slowly. Than if A, A squared, A cubed, if their sizes were growing very slowly. So there's clearly a connection between growth and diameter. Um, I will barely touch upon other subjects or other related notions, such as the mixing time, the diameter. Let me just briefly mention one of them, which is really important, but which we will allude to now and then. So that's, there's what's called the adjacency operator. Well, it's a linear operator. So it's a linear operator on functions f from the set of vertices, which is just g, to the complex numbers. So it takes such a function to another function, and well, it's li it's linear. So a f. What AF will be a function? What will it be? What will its value at V be? It's going to be the average D, where D is the degree of the graph, which here is just A. It's going to, in general, the, the agency operator of a graph does the following. A of F, the transform function, takes here the value of, well, the average of the values of my neighbors. So it's, it's as if we were redistributing everything, and each person gets what the average of his neighbors used to get. The edge set. So of course it is just the same as saying. Very well. And this is a symmetric operator, so it has full real spectrum. So you have, well, the largest eigenvalue, gamma zero, is just D. And then it has all its other eigenvalues are real, just like lambda zero. And there are n of them, when this is the size of the, of the group. Uh, and you can ask yourself, well, what does, this, what does that spectrum look like? And you care particularly about this difference called the spectral gap. In particular, so you want to know that the spectral gap is positive, and if you can give um, you, if you can give a lower bound for the spectral gap, then you're very happy. Giving a lower bound, showing that this spectral gap is at least epsilon, say, is actually stronger than showing that the diameter is roughly as small as it could be, namely logarithmic. So, yeah, an expander family. So, there. Are it's different notions of expansion, but they are all connected. So expansion, we could define, we can say a graph is an epsilon expander, quite simply, if lambda zero minus lambda one. Um, very well. There's a related notion of vertical expansion. It's very closely related. We can go over that in further detail later. Now, let me just, now that we, I have stated more or less what the questions that we will be dealing with will be, uh, let me say that it's, we, we have to find a good lab rat, right? Um, you know, small, white, pink tail, uh, something complex enough to be interesting, but not so big that it's going to bite us or create unnecessary complications. So the lab rat for this course will be SL2. SL2 over a finite field. Actually, the finite field is harder than the complex numbers in this, for this sort of problem, at least if you deal with it naively. Because in the finite field, you don't have the concept of distance. So the distance, topology, they are not going to help you. You have only a very weak sort of topology. There's a risky topology, which is helpful, but it's not like the complex topology. So this will be our lab rat. Um, let me just tell you that uh, it's a pretty paradigmatic lab rat, so to speak to mix metaphors, because um, simple groups, so non-abelian simple groups, well, if they are finite, then the classification of finite simple groups, which is many people's favorite and least favorite theorem at the same time, 
uh, says that all these groups fall into one of three families. They are either um, groups of Lie type, meaning groups that are like Lie groups, only over finite fields, and then some of them have complicated characters, sort of, and the like. So SLN, SON, SP2N, and so on. Then you have um, the symmetric group, or rather the alternating group, which is the so this is the this is the subgroup of the symmetric group of index two. The symmetric group is just the group of all permutations of n elements. Uh, so you no, know, the size of all ten is n factorial over two. Just so that you know what group we're talking about. And then um, you have a lot of monsters, you know. <laughs> but there's only a finite number of them, and all of our statements will be asymptotic, so we don't care about them. Um, all right. So SL2 is fairly characteristic of groups of Lie type. Um, when I first started working the subject, I started with SL2, then generalizing things to higher rank was, hard, was quite hard, and it was done in part by myself and in part by other people. Um, but after that was all done, all said and done, it turned out that, well, the, actually the sort of proofs that I will be giving you now are fairly easy to generalize. They are the sort of second generation proofs for SL2. So you're not missing, you will not be missing out on that much. Now, CMEN, or the permutation groups, are really very interesting, but they are really a, a different kettle of fish. Uh, they are still a kettle, but it's a different kettle of fish. So th there are some elements in common, but we will not go into them so much. We will, I want to give you an idea at the end of the open problems for them. Many of the questions are the same, but the feel is quite different most of the time. The, the tools I will t lecture about today do apply in, for the most part to both cases. All right. So let's stick to groups of Lie type, or well, matrix groups, right? So even among matrix groups, you have different, I said simple, but there are different kinds of groups. So just to get an idea, um, how many of you know what a solvable group is? Everybody. So you don't need to repeat anything, right? So you have a solvable group when you can, so, well, in general, you can decomp you, you always can, simple groups are like the atoms of group theory. And your group is solvable if it decomposes into a billion atoms. That's fair enough. So you can always decompose this so at HI plus one. Simple. All right. That was the briefest review on planet Earth. Um, and you really have very different sorts of behavior, growth-related behavior, depending on whether the group is nilpotent, um, solvable, or not solvable at all, in which case you might as well reduce it by you know, this sequence, the jordan holder the composition, you might reduce it to a simple non-abelian case. And it really feels very different in each case. So nilpotent groups, they can be abelian. So here's an abelian nilpotent group. And here's a group that is not abelian. So this is a call, so the so-called Heisenberg group, which I am, to I am told that the name now has all sorts of rich associations that it did not have 10 years ago, but never mind that. All right. Um, now, uh, in abelian groups, growth can be extremely slow, and diameters can be extremely large. Now, say that the diameter, so say that you're dealing with the group Z mod 2016 Z, um, and you have the generators plus minus one, then what is the diameter of this? What is the diameter of this group with respect to a set of generators plus minus one? Hmm? 1,013. Ah, 1,008. Yes, I, I was thinking of something else. 
Yes, 1008. If it were a two, yeah, well, never mind that. Uh, no, thank you. Uh, yeah, so that's really, really big. A small diameter would be logarithmic or a power of a logarithm. And the same can happen very, very easily in a nilpotent group in general. There are still interesting phenomena in nilpotent groups, but in, in general, you, you do have the diameters can be really big. And it's not that these groups are boring. In fact, um, th as I said, additive combinatorics classically was, and still is for the most part, about abelian groups. You have lo all sorts of interesting behavior for different days. And the generalization of these to nilpotent groups is quite interesting. Um, never mind, but we will not be talking so much about it here. Now, solvable groups, I will be devoting most of tomorrow to that. Uh, they are really quite nice. Um, so here's a, a solvable group. So it's a subgroup of SL2. Uh, I will write indistinctly Z not BZ or, or FP, it means the same thing. Or, you know, you could also have this, which is almost the same thing. Very well, this is so-called affine group, and I rather like it. So th this group, as will become clear, um, has a very close relation to th something that had been considered shortly before I started working on this in additive combinatorics, namely that it has a relation to the study of FP as a field, as in both under well, addition and multiplication. So you have what's called some product phenomena. Now, I, I would like to see some product, so-called some product phenomena as simply a shadow of what happens in the affine group, grows in the affine group. It has a, a rather different, so except for special circumstances, sets A are forced to grow. Some, some special sets A don't, but for the most part they grow. And it's not too hard to show that. And that we'll all, it, there's no algebraic geometry involved in there, at least not for this very simple case. But already some features of the proof for SL2 that we will see are already present here, including a very funny kind of induction. You don't need an ordering, really, to do induction. Now, in the simple non-abelian case, so here, so really, SL2 is not simple. PSL2 is simple, but come on. So um, I don't want to write modulo plus minus one all the time, so I will be working with SL2. So SL2 over a field, K, X, A, B, C, D, and K, and the determinant is one. All right, so really uh, I will be focusing on, you know, this will be my first test case, and this will really be our lab mice. Um, lab mouse, um, very well. All right, so let us get started then. So first of all, many times you will see in native problems that people wonder how big is A plus A. And when I state things over non-abelian groups, I like to state them in terms of A cubed. Uh, now, why A cubed in one case? Why A squared in the other? Why not A to the 25? Uh, it's because um, if uh, A to the 25 is much larger than A, then A cubed is forced to be much larger than A. That's a result that is basically due to Ruja. So, but first of all, let me show you that if A cubed, so in abelian groups, if you have, um, say, that A times A is small, then A to the K is also small. It's going to be at most k to the little of little k. Where big k can be a constant or it can be something quite big, like a power of a, a to the one third or what have you. Now, for uh, for g non-abelian, we can have a 
we, we could have that a times a is very, it's, it's at most a constant, say 3a, and yet a times a times a is huge. A constant times a squared. Uh, is the notation clear, as in less, less, greater, greater? Everybody agrees on what that means? By less, less, I mean less than a constant times. I don't mean much, much less than. Uh, I mean, all right, it's good that you laugh because it means we all agree. But I think there are people in other corners of math that, for, for whom it really means little O of. For us, it means big O of. Big o of. Everybody's happy with this notation and with little O and big O. No cultural problems. Good. Um, all right. So, lemma. However, uh, we are going to have that uh, a to the k, so at least for when a equals a inverse, you have that a to the k over a is at most a cubed over a. So if a cubed over a is small, then already a, uh, it's, that's enough to show that a to the k is small. And you also have, you know, something that shows you that we are allowed to work with a including a inverse by and large. Very well. This is, you, you can prove this, and this is exercise three, you can prove this using the Rouge triangle inequality. It's just an appealing name for the following thing. GIA group, ABC subgroup, the subsets. Then the size of AC inverse. You can find the proof in the notes. It's really quite simple. So, uh, idea of proof. Well, I have to disappoint you. Uh, in combinatorics, much of the time, when you want to prove that some, a set is smaller than the other, you're particularly happy if you can just construct an injection from here to here. It's, it's really, it sounds really stupid, but it makes people happy, and it proves the thing. So, construct injection. And you can find the construction in the notes. It's non-obvious. Yeah. Very well. And what actually, the, the constructing the injection is the clever part. Using that, you can actually prove quite easily the, the, what I have stated on the top. Ah, very good. Um, so as I say in, in the notes, you could take. Uh, hmm? Ah, yes, the question is the following. Uh, can I give an example of this? An example, so I, um, maybe I can. An example where a times a is small, but a cubed is, uh, in, an, in a non-abelian group, a times a is small, but a cubed is large. Uh, well, just take um, a example take A of the form uh, a subgroup, union, an element. Then it's very easy to show that this is true. A times A, simply because the, the only one that you're seeing is the big thing. So H times H is just H, it's a subgroup. So A times A is less than three times A. However, uh, you have that, um, so this is true, but you have that A times A times A contains HGH, which can easily be huge. You, you find actually, uh, in the, again, in the notes you will find some hints as to how to do this, that there are many ways to do this. There are many groups for which you can find many H's and many G's, for which HGH is huge. It's of size H squared, basically. There are no repetitions, almost none. Um, all right. Uh, perhaps I should number these things. Um, so this is probably three and four. Very well. 
Now, you will hear of people talking about approximate subgroups. Um, approximate subgroups mean something pretty close to sets that grow slowly. So, um, do I even need to state what they are? Well, no, not really. Let me just state the keyword. So, approximate subgroups. Let's say, so it's roughly the same. You can reduce one to the other, but it's not quite the same thing, such that A times A times A is not much larger. Yeah, and then what is meant by, well, whether you really want to put a constant or some factor K that is small, that depends on, well, that's a parameter in approximate. And that was just a, a cultural reference. Um, now, um, there are also ideas coming from group theory. Um, you see, some proofs in group theory are extremely concrete, and the, the, in particular, the ones that are elementary and either al algorithmic or quantitative uh, are really surprisingly uh, robust, to the point that uh, you can make them work not for subgroups, as they are usually stated, but for sets, subsets of a group, arbitrary subsets. That probably sounds absurd. So let me give you a really important example that is also really simple. So um, what is the first uh, interesting theorem in group theory that you ever saw? Maybe you don't call it a theorem now, you call it a lemma, but, well, all right. What is the first one you saw? Thank you, you cheated. He's not a plant. I don't even know him, but... <laughs> so let an action, first of all, let me re remind you. So an action is when you have um, a, a homomorphism from G to the group of automorphisms of, uh, of something X, an, o an object X, and if it's, uh, the object X doesn't have much structure, automorphisms just means bijections from X to X. So um, let me see. But, you know, it it's a matrix acts on the plane, it corresponds to intu intuitive notion of action. A symmetric group acts on an element. Very well. So you have, actions have orbits, so if you have x in x, let's, let's, let us just say that x is a set. So an A in G, you can define an orbit to be the set of all elements to which x is taken by elements of A. Um, and the stabilizer, on the other hand, of x is the set of things in G, the group of things in G that do not move x. It's a left action. Very well. So what does the orbit stabilizer theorem say? It's really just a lemma, but... Uh, so let G act on x. Set. Um, and you have x in x, and the classic statement is with h a subgroup of g. And then you have that um, you have that the um, size of the intersection, so the intersection of the group h with the stabilizer is going to be equal to the size of the subgroup divided by the size of the orbit. And the proof is very simple. It's just basically by pigeonhole and counting. And you can even just look at this and convince yourself that you know, this, is, uh, this is some sort of moral law of the universe. I mean, it's, it's really very intuitive once you, once you grok it. I mean, if, there are, if many elements of your group are fixing something, then its orbit under it will be really small and vice versa. 
Now, the astonish you know, if your orbit is really large, then your stabilizer has to be very small, and if your orbit is really small, then many, many of your elements must be fixing things. And that's all very fine, but what happens if I try to generalize this to the case where that is going to be called A, and it's an arbitrary subset of G? Then this is no longer true, but it's almost true. I'm going to split it in two. It's going to be two. I could write this equality twice, right? Um, except that once it's going to be an inequality in one direction. Right? A squared. And the other time it's going to be an inequality in the opposite direction. So. And this is true. And the proof is really simple. Um, yeah, and so I split the, so obviously A is B, you know, these two things are the same if and only if each is greater than or equal to than the other. Um, and then, you know, mo mo modifying those two statements, those two inequalities slightly, I get something true for A completely general. Uh, and that's extremely useful. And notice that when A is actually a subgroup, this, uh, uh, notice that orbit stabilizer, the, the classic orbit stabilizer theorem, is a special case of this, because when A is a subgroup, A times A and A inverse times A both equal A. All right, now that we have this statement, let us use this. So let us start considering actions of the group G, of a group G on itself. Good. So you have you have first of all two highly boring actions. So you could let G act on G by left multiplication or right multiplication. Ha. Um, but these are both really, really boring because the stabilizers are all trivial. So the orbit stabilizer theorem is not telling me anything, it's telling me nothing. But you also have a far more interesting action. Very well. And there, what do we have? So what is a stabilizer in this action? What is a stabilizer of a point H? Exactly. And what is an orbit? What is the orbit of an element H? the conjugacy class. And, you know, groups have really interesting centralized, I mean, there are really interesting centralizers inside groups and conjugacy classes and so on. So, in particular, this is telling us that have a corollary. So you have G, you have A, a subset of G. Then for every G in A to the L, where L is something, some integer, you will have that the, here, the intersection with the stabilizer is going to be at least as large as A divided by the orbit. And the orbit is contained in A L plus two intersection conjugacy class. Um, yes, yes, I should add the condition A equals A inverse, but it's not really necessary. Um, very well. 
All right, and this is actually a very powerful tool, uh, in part because we will see that it's not easy to show that certain intersections of sets A with special subsets, such as conjugacy classes, uh, uh, that certain intersections are not too large. It's not easy, but it's not extraordinarily hard either. But this allows us to translate upper bounds on the denominator, here on the right side, into lower bounds for th this thing in the left side. And lower bounds are extremely useful because a lower bound on this tells you that there are many elements, would tell, would tell you that there are many elements that commute with G. So there are very many elements of a special form. And that's a very, a very useful thing to have. Elements that you know are of a certain form, and many of them. Now, I slandered these uh, actions, left multiplication, right multiplication. I call them boring. Well, no, that was true. But um, you can take quotients, and they become really nice. Um, so let me state another corollary. Let G, a group. H subgroup then A to the K plus one. This what what is this that first of all? So the proof is easy part. The proof says that you, well, you just consider the action of G on G mod H by le left multiplication. And you apply the orbit stabilizer theorem. So both of these proofs are by orbit stabilizer. Um, but here, moreover, um, what do you have? Um, this is telling you that uh, if a, if the intersection of A with a subgroup grows rapidly, then A itself grows rapidly. And it's only one result out of several of this type. You can also show that if the number of, of cosets of something intersecting A grows rapidly, then A grows rapidly, and so on. It's really another powerful tool here. No, I could state another. Another corollary, and this is the proof is completely on you. Um, so G H G, you have that the intersection, but it's really, really just pigeonhole. The intersection of A inverse A with subgroup H has to be large. It has to be at least A divided by R, where R is a number of cosets of H intersecting. Yeah, in, in particular, if H is a pretty large subgroup and A is not too small, A inverse A is going to have a large intersection with H. All right. That's about it for the preliminaries. Now, um, let me make some remarks about abelian groups. Uh, they are important for the history of the subject. They are important for the subject nowadays. And uh, this will really give you an idea of how different what we will be doing in the rest of the course will be. So abelian groups. Again, this is a subject for a book, not for 15 minutes. But I want you to get an idea of what this is like. So this is a subject that started slow. I mean, the name is recent, but it was already starting to take shape well, in the 60s, but there were some results from the 30s. But it's always about you have abelian groups G and you have A subset G. And you ask yourself, well, since it's an abelian group, we will write plus rather than times. Um, when is it the case that A plus A is barely larger than A? So what does barely larger mean? Uh, it can mean just a constant factor. In fact, it can mean A plus A could be as small as twice the size of A. So, well, in the case, you could also, yes, for G finite, A could be all of G, and then 
A times A could just be equal to A, of course, or it could be a subgroup. But even if G is Z, which is a classical case, even if G equals H, A equals Z, excuse me, which has, of course, no finite subgroups, um, you can have the A plus A is barely larger than A. Well, give you an example of a set A for which A plus A is at most size twice the size of A. Yes, an arithmetic progression. So it could be one, two, up to 10, or it could be to be more interesting. Then um, A plus A, so these are the integers congruent to, one, to 2 modulo 3, and so a plus a will be integers congruent to 1 modulo 3. Uh, not, not 1, but 7. Sorry, 4, 7, <laughs> 10, and so on, until, well, 6n minus 2. And it's easy to see that, um, so a plus a is 2n minus 1, is 2a. So, uh, you can try to generalize this, so you could have, if an arithmetic progression is like a line, you could have a sort of generalized progression that would be um, like a square, so two different moduli. You sometimes, you, you can add as many threes and elevens as you wish, and you still have that gross is small, gross is by a factor of at most four in that case. Uh, amazingly, that's basically the only example there is. I mean, you know, allowing plenty of fudge, that's basically the only example there is. Um, I'm going to give you the statement of the main theorem in the fe in of the one of the main theorems of additive combinatorics, perhaps the main one. Um, so let me define things in a very modern way. Uh, give you a group. So a centered convex progression. of dimension D is a set P and G, which is an intersection of a subset Q of RD that is convex and symmetric, that is symmetric around the origin and uh, you also have a homomorphism from set to the D to G such that phi ZD, so the image of the intersection of the convex set with the grid of integers is P. And we say P is proper if the restriction is injective. All right, and now let me state what's called Fry the Freiman theorem, or rather the freiman Ruge theorem, that's probably the first name. The proof got much simplified by Ruge, who also generalizes the theorem to arbitrary abelian G. For G abelian and A finite, and A such that A plus A is less than a certain factor K times A, A is contained in at most F of K copies of P plus H, where P is a proper uh, centered convex progression of small dimension and P uh, and H is, is a finite subgroup. 
And moreover, you want this to be it contained here, but without too much waste. P plus H should be not much larger. So P plus H is at most, say, E to the G of K, say, times A. So A is a relatively large subset of something that is a generalized progression, no? T uh, pl uh, I mean, t plus a subgroup. It's that simple. It's a full characterization. Now, fk, gk, I did not tell you what they are. They are some functions that depend on k. At first, the proof was not explicit, and when people made it explicit, the dependencies were bad. But nowadays, there are very nice dependencies. So best dependencies, that's um, f of k, g of k at most, log k, 3 plus little of 1. This is basically Sanders. Well, Sanders got 4, and this was improved to 3 by Konyagin. Um, it's believed that, in fact, you can p the theorem should be true with f and g bounded by a constant times log k, but that's unknown. Well, this is almost as good in practice. Um, all right. So this is a situation for abelian groups. There can be groups, there can be sets that grow extremely slowly as by a constant factor at each step. However, they can be really nicely characterized. What about sets that grow in a fairly relaxed fashion? We used not to know anything about them, but now some of them are actually covered by the by Freiman Ruja with strong bounds. No? And then there's still some unknown zone. But the point is that you can have the entire range of behaviors. So you can have sets that grow really slowly, more rapidly, more rapidly. So it, all sorts of sets, all sorts of gross behavior, essentially, at least in one given step. And whether things can wobble, that's a different subject. Um, very well. And this is also the case pretty much for nilpotent groups. So Freiman Ruja has been, by now been generalized to nilpotent groups. Um, in part by somebody in the audience. Um, at any rate, um, if I think we can, I think I can give you a bit more general call. I have five minutes. Do I have five minutes? All right, very good. So I think that the best thing now. I leave affine, the affine groups, so solvable groups for tomorrow. And now I will, I mentioned geometric group theory, so I am pretty much duty bound to give you a tiny bit of it. So, um, for G abelian, Even if you have a, a very funny set A that grows fairly rapidly at first, as it could happen for G abelian, in the long run, say G is abelian and infinite, in the long run, the growth will be polynomial. Of course, the constant and degree of the polynomial will depend on the set A. But it's, it's actually quite easy to convince yourselves the growth is polynomial because a to the k is at most, I mean, the order of the summons does not alter the sum. So the number of possible arrangements is at most this. So, yeah. And then it's clear that this is a polynomial. Um, so it's in fact it's bound it's it's a degree a polynomial of degree at most a minus one. Might be huge, but still. All right, and um, for nilpotent groups you have pretty much the uh, so and the, the same is true for nilpotent groups. But then you can ask yourself. The, converse, the inverse question. This is for the Freiman-Ruja theorem. Somebody gives you a specific growth phenomenon 
And you can ask, well, what does that tell you about A? Or in this case, in part because you are dealing with this gross model phenomena for G infinite, what does this tell you about the group G? Um, yeah. And here, so you have different generations, I would say, in geometric group theory. So there are results from the late 60s. You can find all the references in the notes, saying that um, if you know a g solvable, a generating g, if this has polynomial growth, then g has an important subgroup. So things really reduce to the, the important case, an important subgroup of finite index. Um, that was first of all, and then it was shown that this was more general. It was shown that uh, you just, even for G linear, but not necessarily solvable, you just assume that G is linear, and then you get that uh, if the rows of uh, some set, so these are all infinite, if the growth of some set of generators is polynomial, then G has a polynomial subgroup of finite index. This is states from 72. And then, well, the next generation really was Gromov, who proved something quite amazing in his, genera in, in his generality. So, well, he proved that this was true for any G. In general, for any G, if you have polynomial growth, your growth is ba your group is basically nilpotent, and that was pretty amazing. I think it, it was a big jump from here to here, with all due respect to the really foundational work of all of these guys, um, because what Gromov was doing was uh, starting from an arbitrary group without any geometry. Any linear group has a certain geometry, even if it's over a finite field. But with, from an arbitrary abstract group, abstract infinite group, Gromov managed to construct a geometry a large-scale geometry, using the fact that the growth is polynomial. And that's amazing, and that really gives geometric groups, well, modern geometric group theory its flavor. We will not go down that route, but you should know that it exists. No. And as to whether there's a link between what we will be doing and geometric group theory, there have been some links established, especially by logicians such as Khrushchevsky, well, mostly Khrushchevsky, but um, I, uh, there are some works derived from Khrushchevsky by Briar Grintal, but I, feel, I really feel that clarifying the links between growth in this sense, or the study of growth in this sense, and the study of growth as we will undertake it, is a very open-ended task that should be explored further. And here I think I can leave the f field open for questions. Questions? Yes. Uh, I was going to ask, so it seems like you're suggesting that the generalization of abelian is nilpotent. Hmm? Um, it seems like you're suggesting that... In, it's nilpotent things behave like abelian. It's not just abelian, it's a special case of nilpotent, but very grosso modo nilpotent things behave sort of like abelian. Yeah, so why not solvable? It seems like solvable would have been, would have been a natural guess. Or... Um, we will look at it. You will get your answer next class. It's, it really has a different flavor from classical additive combinatorics. In these theorems of Tietz and Gromov, um, A is a finite, it's finitely finite. generated groups. Is, any, is there anything known about non-finitely generated groups? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, but if you're dealing with A finite, it's just as if you're just dealing with, you're, you're, we're dealing with finite sets. And we might as well restrict to the group generated by A, which is by definition finitely generated. So um, I'm sure your question makes some sense that I don't know, but, uh, but we don't have to work with that.
So just a comment on that last slide for um, maybe for people who don't have an experience geometric group three. Polynomial growth actually has two meanings, which is there's the strong meaning, which means that you can bound the growth above and below by a polynomial of the same ah, degree, all right, say. All right. And there's a weaker meaning, which is just that you can bound it above by some polynomial function okay. without any kind of tightness on the bounds. And it's one thing, given a nilpotent group, to show that the growth is um, polynomial in the strong sense. So that you can do. So what's kind of remarkable about Gromov's result is it allows you for an arbitrary group to upgrade polynomial growth in the weak sense, just giving an upper bound um, by a polynomial for the growth, to polynomial growth in the strong sense. That is, That's one of many grows, remarkable things. Yes. Yeah, actually polynomially on the nose. So, uh, and to give some, some, thank you very much, and uh, to try to give a sense to the question about finite generation, I mean, one can, instead of dealing just with finite sets and their sizes, one can deal with um, sets and their measures. But th then, actually, f a lack of finite generation is not a big deal. I mean, we would really be going off a tangent, but the methods we will do do apply to more generally to uh, set, I mean, people have generalized them, namely uh, Burgan and Gambert have generalized them to some compact groups where you have things are not finally generated and you're dealing with measures, not just with. But you, you basically reduce to this, to this case. Other questions? Yes. Yes. Um, in in both in all directions. Uh, in all directions. I mean, did you get different things for yes? I mean, if you're just dealing with finite subsets over SL2R, the result is actually easier. 